Welcome, my name is Steve Rosted. Uh, I work for VMware, and um, I'm one of the reviewers for all PrintK patches that come through, and I pur purposely made myself be a reviewer because I use PrintK extensively. It's one of the things I actually use to debug ftrace with. And I wanted to be a reviewer so I could keep any crap out that I didn't want to think. <laughs> and I always do my little selfie in front of everyone. Hi. Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, anyway. I have a lot of slides. As those that know me or seen my talks before, I usually sometimes um, make animation more than presentations. So first I'm going to start off with uh, what is PrintK? And I'm assuming that most everyone here knows what PrintK is. I mean, okay, anyone not know what PrintK is? Okay, uh, one hand went up. Everyone else is afraid because I just said everyone knows PrintK. So when I said uh, no one knows, or it goes, raise your hand if you don't, you're like, wait, everyone knows PrintK. Uh, I'm going to pretend I do too. So that's not really fair to say it that way. But print K is basically the print F of the kernel. And when I first started doing kernel development within uh, back in 98 uh, for my master's, well, actually, I was going for my master's, and one of the projects was working in the kernel. And the people I was working with uh, wanted, they said, how do we print to debug our code that we're modifying? and they put in include standard IO into the header file, compiled it, and didn't understand why it didn't work. Um, everything in the kernel is self-contained. Uh, all functions are written within the kernel. So there is no libc. So it's printf, but it's, I'm glad it's called printk. Some people said we should have called it printf. And I'm like, no, I'm glad it's called printk. And you always know a kernel developer, when they do uh, user space code, because they always type printk and their code doesn't compile. <laughs> So basically, it's uh, print K is a pretty obvious thing. It's used to display information, show stack traces when your uh, system crashes, and panics. Um, I went back and did a little uh, archaeology, or whatever you want to call it, in, into the uh, uh, Linux kernel history. And I downloaded Linux 1.0, and I said, what does print K look like there? And it's actually not much different than it does today. First thing that happens is you uh, copy if interrupts are on or off. You save, that's that first save flags means, you know, are interrupts enabled? Uh, then clear, uh, you save it into flags variable, and then you clear interrupts. You then, this is actually familiar code, that's, you've probably seen this in user space. By the way, that vsprintf is implemented in the kernel, there's no library there. The VA start is kind of a compiler thing, so it doesn't need to be implemented. But the vsprintf has to be implemented. And it's kind of strange, because you look at the buff plus three. And I love this comment, true quality assurance. So then this, we go through this loop, uh, starting with buff plus three, strange, and we go into a buff end. And then we signed our message. The message we're going to print is going to equal to P. And then we check this thing called the message level. What's this message level? But if you notice, it starts off at negative one. Um, so if message level is less than zero, that means this is the first iteration of this loop where we check message run or message level. And we check to see for this, is this thing that just was passed to print K start with a less than sign, followed by with some number between zero and seven, followed by a greater than sign. If, it, if that's false, we do this, def we say, we create in that minus three, which is why we have the plus three. We now do a minus three and we write in the less than sign, default message log level minus one plus you know, colon zero to get an actual number in there and put a greater than sign. Otherwise, we just have the message jump over the, uh, the three characters that has that message level. And then we say, okay, now P will now equal, P1 equals some number from zero to seven. So we save that in our message level. So when the loop comes around, we know what to do. This is the second half of print K. It's not that big of a function. I mean, I have the full print K function from uh, version 1.0 in two slides. Again, we're going to start where P left off and go to the end. And then we would look at the, uh, uh, with this little thing, does, is the uh, ring buffer. Log buff is the, uh, the ring buffer within the kernel in 1.0. And we did the old, you know, add the start plus the size and add it to a mask, which has to be, of course, um, power of two. And we, we when we, copy whatever P is pointing to into that. And we keep looping around. 
here's a little luggage logic that does those normal ring buffers that you learned in school, how to do if you have a fixed size array and you want to spin around, um, you do the increments of the, uh, point, the start pointer and the size. And now if we hit a new line, we're going to break out of this loop because our message is done. We only do one message per line. Now here's that where that message level came from. We look at the message level and we look at the uh, uh, console log level, which is something that the user space has given us, saying this is how much we want to uh, print, and I'll talk about this later. And if it's less than this user space number, and there's actually a print function that will do something with this, has those two have to be true, then we're going to go ahead and call this code. Uh, the temp records uh, whatever is after that uh, slash n, or if it's zero, so we're you know with the log buffer we're expecting the buffer here. There might actually be an off by one bug here. I'm not, I didn't really look into it, um, but it expects that we're at the end of our string, and we're going to look at the one plus of uh, head uh, one character forward, and if that character or what uh, what's it called? We're going to save that character because we're going to put in a null terminating character. So we could call this console print function that hopefully exists. No, it does exist now. It's not null. And we'll pass the message to it. And the message will end with the null character so it prints properly. And now here, and then we put it back, the character that we swapped out with the null character. Now at this point here, we check to see if it's a slash n because if it is a slash end, we know we broke out of the loop without hitting an end of line. We actually broke out because of slash n, which means there probably there might be another message behind it. So we set message level back to negative one and repeat the process. After that loop is finally done and we're done with all our messages, we do this wake up of a task. That's a log wait. So print k basically does everything but from there that's done is somewhat the same of what we do today. It has log levels. Um, it has a fixed size ring buffer. It sends to some console. And it wakes up some user space task if it's waiting on information that the kernel wants to print. The log levels, which were from back then to today, they're still from 0 to 7. Uh, the lower the number, the more likely it will print. In fact, current emerge will always print. That's we, um, there's code to make sure that the log level is never less than 1. So the lowest log level you could put is uh, 1. So it goes from 1 to 8. If you put in 8, that means print everything. If you put in 1, it means just print when the system basically crashes. So you can set this variable number on the kernel command line, and there's also, um, uh, what's it called, the kernel command line, or um, syscontrol, I believe, or proc file system somewhere. Log levels are usually, when in the kernel, if you look at the kernel, you'll see something like print k, uh, parenthesis, kern warning, followed by some sort of string. And that kern warning is a defined of up, like right there would be colon four. Um, if you were to compile or run this preprocessor on your code, but when you put in print k with the kern warning on it, it would, the old way would show you with the less than sign, the number four, the greater than sign, followed by some um, string, which is why you saw that weird, strange code in uh, print k. You don't have to put that in there. Remember back in the print k, back here, uh, maybe I shouldn't have gone back there, but let me see here. Um, you'll see that it adds that default log message. So if you leave it off, that default message will be your log level that you have at that time. I told you I have a lot of slides. The new way is they don't do the lesson sign. They use one character, which is nice. It's just, you know, uh, hex character one. So it's not printable. So it could now get to find by a single compare to check to say, hey, this has a log level. If it's not there, it's a message. So the, the ring buffer in the print k, <coughs> it's a fixed size. Um, you could change the size on boot up with the kernel command line with log buff length. Uh, it's been recently changed, not recently, but it's been changed since 1.0 from that simple ring buffer thing to a more complex, uh, actually passing in bi binary messages and such. And now they contain a timestamp. Log, the log level is actually stored as a binary thing um, inside the, um, the print a ring buffer today the, as a message. It has some metadata that you can add to it and then the, the data string that you want to attach to it. Today it's protected by spin locks. So you can't call it from an NMI. What you do, we do, we can. And we're, we have code coming up, which we'll probably talk to in the next talk. 
uh, explain that. By the way, this is a two-part talk. For some reason, I submitted this talk to um, ELC slash OSS, and they accepted it twice. And then he said, could you make it twice as thing? But by, thank God Sergey came here. He's going to do the second half on this on Wednesday, which will be after uh, Colonel Summit tomorrow that where we're discussing the problems with Print K and hopefully solve, come up with a solution. Um, <coughs> of course, Print K is useless if it doesn't go anywhere. If you're writing it to a memory log, log buffer, it's kind of useless sitting there unless you have K exec K dump where you can go and uh, retrieve it, which K exec K dump you can do that with, with a utility crash. But most likely you want to see this as it's going on. So it's got to go someplace. It's got to go to the monitor. It's got to go to frame buffer or frame buffers. It could go to the su uh, serial port, network console. There's even a Braille console that you could get print K from. Um, <coughs> in today's logic, uh, print K uses two different things. It uses a spin lock and a console lock, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And another problem with uh, print K, with NMIs at least, is the consoles themselves could have spin locks that you have to watch out for and worry about. Um, when a task wakes up, which does today, we uh, usually wake up syslog D or some other utility that might be on most mas machines today. And <coughs> that what some, usually when you have these kernel messages going out, you want to put them someplace. You want to put them someplace where users could see them and don't have to actually use D message because D message is a fixed size ring buffer. And if you get too much information in it, it blows it away. So you want it recorded while it's still available. Then multiprocessors happen. So <coughs> back in uh, January, I, I did this whole Git. Well, actually, it wasn't a Git bisect because it was before Git. So I actually just kept downloading stable, or not stable. They're not even, this is before stable existed. But I downloaded a bunch of uh, development trees, and I did a bisect download, finding where was the first time Spinlock appeared in Print K. And I found it, it was in 19 January 1998 in 2.180 a spin lock was introduced to print K. That's the first time it was actually be able to run on a multiprocessor system. And all print Ks were serialized. It did a spin lock in the beginning, did all the prints, wrote to the consoles, everything else, and then finally released that print K. But that doesn't scale. It has issues. And remember, print K can be very slow, especially going over a serial port. And back then, you know, not everything was the, you know, 115,200 balls. If you had your 96 ball, you know, 9600 ball uh, modem, it really was slow. So when you have a print K, if you had three print Ks that went off at the same time, and the first one got, uh, got, the, got the print K lock, and it did its printing, and the second one's blocked, it's got to wait until the first one's done printing. The third one that came off, not only does it have to wait for the first one, it has to wait for the second one, wait to the third one. And this could get bigger and bigger and bigger, depending on how many CPUs you have, which shows you why this doesn't scale. And it basically, while this happens, so if you had uh, eight CPUs doing like a print K, that the print K could take easily 10 milliseconds, if it's a slow modem or something like that. But right there, can you imagine your system with 10 CPUs, you know, 8 times 10, you know, it gets up there pretty fast. And it's, well, it's linear up there, but um, it could, the system stops. The whole system is locked up, and that causes that people don't really like it when you're in the middle of playing uh, some sort of video, uh, online video game, or you're just about to, you know, quake or whatever, you're just about to shoot the guy, and your system locks up because everything's tied to print, and you get killed. So the console um, lock semaphore was introduced. In 2001 and 2410, it was added. And it two, it, we have two locks now. We have a log buff lock. The, the, the lock that protects that, that in-memory ring buffer is a spin lock, a normal spin lock, nothing different, nothing special. You grab the spin lock, you write to the log buffer, you release the spin lock, everything's fine. The console lock is just strange. The first holder of the console lock does the printing. Everyone else just says, okay, thank you, goodbye. And this guy who has the console lock will do the printing for everyone. So when you look at the, the console lock isn't the big deal. You can easily get the console lock. The magic is in the console unlock. So when you look into print K, if you go into today and you look at print K and you look at and you find console lock, you'll see this thing, you'll see this if statement right there, where it says, if console try lock, the console unlock. You know, if you look at that, you're like, wait a minute, why? What are you protecting? What is the purpose of that? And that's because console unlock is a behemoth. This is console unlock, the code, 
with a lot removed from it. I, re I stripped out all comments, stripped out uh, a bunch of stuff, and in fact, in that for loop, I condensed it down to nothing because there's a lot of work in there too. Uh, when you do a console unlock, first thing you do is, is the console suspended? If so, release the semaphore and return. Do nothing else. You're done. Then we say, can the console scheduler schedule? Like, are we in a preemptible state? If we are, then we might be able to, uh, we could do a, we check to see if something else wants to run on our CPU. So while we're printing these messages, uh, we'll check every so often, oh, we should schedule out and let someone else run. While we're holding the console lock. Um, <coughs> which is interesting, I have to do this. So, uh, next. We also want to see if we can use the console, because consoles, ca consoles can be turned off, so then we have to unlock. We do this for loop that go iterates through all the registered consoles. So you could have multiple consoles. You could have your video console, you could have a UART, you could have special devices. Each one, this is a, Lulu, um, a for loop that goes through each one of these, everything you registered that you put on the kernel command line, console equals blah, blah, blah. You do that multiple times, and it's going to go f iterate through each one of those, writing the data out to each one, one at a time. Each time, checking to see if it could schedule if it was in a schedule context. If preemption was disabled, Nope, it's not going to do it. It's going to finish everything. The console lock variable gets set when you get the lock, and it's a way to tell the rest of the kernel I, the console is locked, because there's logic in there that says, oh, if the console is locked, uh-oh, warn, or let's warn on this. That's usually, if you do a search for this, you'll find it like in the frame buffer code and such, which is another big mess that I'm not going to talk about. That's, that's a full story in itself. This exclusive console was something I just discovered, well, today. <laughs> I'll talk about that later. <laughs> now, finally, you release the or you unlock the log buff because we had the log buff held on for when we were doing the uh, some work, and then we console and then grab the log buff, and then we check to see if um, this is this magic that says, "Hey, you know, someone wrote code." So, because we could, uh, we do this retry, which is look at the console sequence and see if there's something new there. Well, this, so we do this after we release the console lock. And then if you notice below there, that's that other red thing, is I say, okay, if retry is set, we try to grab the console lock. If we fail to grab the console lock, we know someone else did, and they'll do this work. But no, if, we get the, if we're the lucky one that gets the console lock again, that means that someone wrote more data, and we go back and said, oh, you're the one, so you fill it up. And then eventually, we're going to wake up whatever's waiting and to read the console data. So today, Instead of having the whole system locked up, we just lock up one CPU. And if you have, say, 180 CPUs, and you have a driver that just loves to tell everyone that, hey, I did a timer and said, hey, I, I'm alive, like I keep alive something, or there's some really drivers that seem to like to tell everyone something. So it just, it, it wants to be known, it wants to be loved. <laughs> yes, it's a millennial driver. Hey, my kids are millennials. <laughs> so I can kind of agree with that. Uh, no. So you, the first guy comes in, does the right. The lucky one that gets the council. Okay, remember, th with the right log in that kind of turquoise-ish, whatever color, I don't know what you want to call that. Uh, that's where the log buff is held. It's a spin lock, so no one could do it at the same time. So it's only, those are, that's serialized, that's fine. But when you get the console try lock, you keep running, and you print your stuff. Well, on task two on another CPU comes in, does a write log. And so you're like, oh, we got more data. I'm going to write this guy's out. Task three comes in, does some more data. Oh, got more data. Go right. Task two comes back. Oh, I want to do another print K. So you see, this could go back on. And that print K latency is unbounded. It could go forever. And this could happen inside an interrupt. This could happen with interrupts disabled, with uh, preemption disabled. So your CPU is now hard. Locked, live locked. It's not a deadlock, it's a live lock. It's running, it's doing work, but it's not doing anything else but being the servant for all the other CPUs. And what happens is you could have a watchdog timer go off saying, hey, interrupts haven't gone on the CPU in like seconds. This CPU is locked up hard. Do a panic. And what does a panic do? Cause breaking. <laughs> Going back to exclusive console, it was added in March of 2011. 
Uh, what hap what they found out, which was kind of weird, if you had a, on your kernel command line, you know, console equals TTY1, console equals TTY MFD2, whatever that is, console equals TTY S0, early prick A equals MRST, they all are registering consoles. And this is actually, I copied this from the uh, change log that I found the code from git blame. And each console, when it registers it, it will re it resets, when you register a console, it resets the start count, start of the of the buffer back to the beginning and calls the console lock and the, or calls the console unlock to print everything out for that console. Well, what was happening was, you know, you register, a co you register the first guy, it would, there's a bunch of stuff in the print K and it would print out everything for on the TTY1. You register the next console, it says, oh, reset it, I need TT this new console to print everything else out. So it will print everything else out, but since that, remember that console loop that went through all the consoles? Well, TTY1 would print out everything again. And then the, you get the second console. The third register comes in, or the third, your TTYS0 comes in, and it says, oh, we have to register another one. Let's reset it, and let's call TTY1 again. Now I have everything, and console three. And then the early print K would come in, so TTY1 just printed everything out four times. So the solution was to make this exclusive console set. So when you register to console, you put down exclusive console and you say equal to um, the console you have. So w in that loop that you're going through, uh, the, the exclusive console, when you do the prints, it was in there, it said, if I'm not the exclusive console, skip me. Don't print me out, we, we're going to be the one. But in 2012 of May, which isn't that much further away from when this was added, the whole, this is where we went from a ring buffer type of, uh, a normal simple memory ring buffer to that message layout because journal D needed some more information, want, needed more power on how to read from the kernel buffer. So it needed more metadata, needed messages. So it was rewritten and the code there, the origin of a console no longer reset everything back. So this exclusive console, which so when you register something, there's a race here now. So if you register something now and print case are happening, and then you jump into the print K unlock, the only the exclusive console, the one that just was registered, would print anything. All the other consoles will miss that print K. But and I'm looking at it, the code, it's obsolete. It shouldn't be there. Why is it still there? Because no one noticed it was obsolete until I did this presentation and was reviewing the slides. So I went through and went, hmm, what's this for? I'm like, oh God. Some people say that the best way to do, or the, there's a, so many bugs that have been fixed in the kernel by presentations. The scheduler, this is a fun one too. Um, we want print K to work everywhere because you know that's our debug thing. And of course, when something goes wrong, how do we let everyone know, print K? So in the scheduler, a lot could go wrong. If you've ever seen that code, it's quite complex. There's a lot of checks and to make sure things are going as we think they are. And if there's something's wrong, or if you turn on debugging, um, it will check stuff. And if you have something that gets scheduled, you're scheduling within Atomic, it will print something. But print K holds a run queue lock. And the run queue lock is the, is the lock that prevents any scheduling to happen on that CPU. And uh, obviously it needs to do that because uh, the scheduler needs to look at tasks and doesn't want people to add new tasks to the CPU when it determines what tasks to run next. So the run queue lock is very important. It's also to protect, like I said, you don't want to add new tasks to the scheduler if you're um, <coughs> about to do the schedule. So you can't do a wake up. The problem is console unlock, remember um, it's a semaphore. If there's something waiting on that console lock to say, okay, I'm waiting for you because it's not just print K that uses console lock, there's other things. The guy reading that wants to read the, um, the log or the D message that blocks on console lock so it could get information as well. And there's lots of things I could do console or uses console lock and block. So when you do the print K, you do console unlock and you release the semaphore, you do a wake up. And right here, you know, you do your scheduler, you have, um, your, you do some sort of spin lock on the run queue. You do something, you call print K. Print K is going to do console unlock, which wake up with, does the release of the semaphore which wakes a process, which grabs your run, which if that process happens to be on the same CPU, it grabs the run queue lock, boom, deadlock. So to handle this case, this is in the kernel, this is there today. 
uh, we have something called uh, print k sked, uh, which is now called print k deferred. Um, it was originally uh, had its own CPU buffers that would just kind of, um, the CPU buffers would, it would write the stuff into the CPU buffers and then later on it would wake up and read these CPU buffers and then do the actual print case on them. Uh, I noticed, like I said, this is kind of a waste to have these extra buffers in there because I noticed that I said, you know, the actual buff, the, the buffer to the print K is just protected by normal spin locks, not this magic console lock. And the spin locks only protect that buffer and you don't call anything else when you hold these special sp the, the spin locks. So you can nest them inside a run queue lock. I said, you know, instead of doing that, print K just, just grab the normal log buff lock, write to the print K log buffer, and then release it. And then later on, make sure that gets flushed out. It used to, the flushing used to happen on the next jiffy tick. So if you're, you know, if you're no hurt or your hertz is set to 100, so 100 times a second, a tick goes off and does some work. So the, if something happens in print K, you know, you have your 100, uh, uh, what's it called, 100 microseconds later or whatever it is, or 100 divided by what's 10 hertz or something, or 10, 10 milliseconds, I think. 10 milliseconds later, you would, um, oh, my watch, I think I just hit 10,000 temps. I, I, I pace, Fitbit. Um, so if 10 milliseconds later, uh, your print will happen. So if something else happened and something crashes, you won't get those prints in that 10 milliseconds. So today we use IRQ work. What IRQ work does is it sets up a flag inside, if the architecture support it, x86 does, you set up a flag and says, okay, um, we'll write to the bu buffer, kill out, kick off IRQ work, IRQ work will, s will basically send an IPI to itself, to, to, to your CPU. So as soon as interrupts are enabled again, it will take it, your CPU will take it to interrupt and then call the function that you assign and it will do the flushing. But you still can't do the printing within the actual output to the consoles within the run queue lock. That's today and the way it ever was. NMIs are another fun thing. You know, a print cake could happen in an NMI. And it used to be, it was a crapshoot. Um, we had control M or L, or sys, sys, control, or sorry, sys request key M or L, I can't remember which. What? L. Sys request L. That's M is memory. Sys request L, so if you do uh, echo L into slash proc sysrq dash trigger, it sends an IPI to all the CPUs, or and all the CPUs will trigger an NMI, or actually not your IPI, it sends off a, a trigger to trigger NMIs on every single CPU. And what that does, it will do a stack dump. So basically, if you find out your system's kind of like, okay, it's, it's something's locked on one of the CPUs, or you detect this in the kernel, you could trigger a stack dump everywhere, or you could do it from manually. Um, so you can manually say, do, like, let me see where, where everything is, where something's spinning, I don't know why it's spinning so much, call an NMI, to, and it will, it will send an NMI to that CPU, and an NMI non-maskable interrupt, for those that don't know, uh, which means it will always trigger, um, regardless if interrupts are enabled or disabled. So when it calls the NMI, the NMI will then do a stack dump, and it shows you where everything is. And it does that by print K. In the old days, we, were, we just were careful about doing that because you could just set it off, and if the print K happened to happen during a print K, or while the console lock was held, you could crash the system. Actually, I'm asking you pr uh, if it's L, it's on my slide. <laughs> so, one of the solutions from 2.4 to 4.11 was this awesome function called zap locks. I, th I believe we got rid of it, which is sad because I just love the name. Um, it sets this variable called oops in progress to one. And it lets the system know I'm dying. B so don't worry about deadlocks. Don't worry about being consistent. Just get the information out why I'm dying. So zap locks would kind of reinitialize uh, the, the buffer, the spin locks, although, and reinitialize the console stem. So if NMI goes off and it says we're dying, we're triggering something, reinitialize anything. So just in case I preempted the uh, print K, I'm going to, wh whoever I preempted, I'm going to say, no, you don't own the lock anymore. I'm going to run and write everything out. It works great, except it's not aware of the console locks. So if it happened to happen during one of the console spin locks, you're screwed anyway. Again, a crapshoot. So, to handle the um, the one situation where we use sys request L, 
um, I took a I took the seek buffer that's used by trace uh, uh, ftrace and also used kind of like seek printing. It's a way to pass a uh, bunch of data from function to function or uh, like string data. So you could write to you could do like a printf or something and then pass it off to the next guy. They could do a printf and you could attach a lot of str uh, information. Like this is how trace events work. So I decided, no, if I make this, I could probably use the NMI stuff. So if you do sys request L, it will <coughs> write. The, I could I added a function pointer for print k to be able to switch per CPU. So I, this, when you did print k, it didn't actually call the print k code. It actually called a function uh, a per CPU function pointer that would jump to the print k code. Now I was able to enter or set a way when I went to NMI saying I'm doing a dump. I'm going to switch it to this other function that's not going to write to the consoles, but it's going to write to the seek buffer. And at the end, when it's after all the seek buffers are done, and when the NMI is done, it switches that per CPU pointer back to normal printf or printk. And I have some other guy in a nice, good context, knowing that I can't preempt the console holder. It will actually read all the NMI per CPU buffers and print it out nicely. So there's no more deadlocks. The way it worked was you do your sys request L, sends all the triggers to NMIs, runs to the seek buff, and there. Then I had, like I said, save context for CPU. So that's your visual of that. Simple. Well, it doesn't solve normal NMI code because NMI code that determines, oh, we're about to crash or something like that, we want that data out and we don't have the luxury of a safe context per se, sort of. So code is working on how to do that. So if you have a panic or warn on, or it's not, it's really still a crapshoot. So in 4.7, uh, NMI vprintk was created. And what happened was when you turned into, or whenever you entered the NMI, and there's functions, whenever you enter an NMI, um, uh, there's a NMI enter code and there's an NMI exit code, it would call printk NMI. So the NMI entered would call printk NMI enter, and then the NMI exit would call printk NMI exit. And what that would do would switch that function pointer to be this NMI vprintk, which would do something different. And then when the NMI happened, it would write to the seek buffer, or a actually they now changed the buffer. It used it, it, the seek buffer wasn't, um, they needed a little bit more uh, flexibility than what the seek buffer did. So they added a little bit more lock or protection, I guess, atomic counters and stuff like that. So. Uh, changes, but it's basically the same, uh, exact same design where it writes to a pre-allocated buffer. And at the end, on the exit, it switches it back and will then send it off through IRQ work so that when the NMI is done, it will get to a safe, um, safe state where the NMI will, or the IRQ work will flush out all the NMIs. The problem is with this is if the system locks up hard, you don't get your data out the NMI won't work. Uh, I played with this a little bit, and actually I found out was it would work mostly, it, there's a case, at least the latest stuff today, will work um, if all C if there's one CPU still alive, and it will that one CPU could actually work. But if all CPUs log up or you're in a processor system, you're screwed. Then someone noticed, I think this is more Sergey's work, um, what about a print K within a print K, which can happen? Remember, uh, <coughs> we could do warn-ons anywhere. Uh, so, yes? Was it? Was this? Wait. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> Reminds me of the drunken patch, <laughs> where I turn void to vid on ch changing um, uh, a comment. And uh, Thomas Kleckner was with me too, and he acted. And I sent it out, and I, and, um, I got all I did the next day, I got a message from Andrew Martin saying, bah. OK. <laughs> so what happens here on print K, um, it does a console unlock does all your printing, and then um, it wakes up a pending task. 
But for say something happened where when it did the wake up, you had some code wrong and that wake up caused a warning for some reason. It would cause print K and it would do a tri console try lock. Um, remember, we already upped the semaphore, so it gets the lock because we only wake up after we release the semaphore. So we do that, we get the lock and it does a try lock, but now it does the, um, tries to get this, um, wait. Oh, sorry, I have to go back. Let me re re change that. When you unlock the semaphore, the semaphore itself has a raw spin lock. So it actually has a real spin lock. So when you do, the way it works is it does grabs the spin lock, does the wake up, and then it releases the spin lock within the semaphore code. That's why there's an up, you see the squiggly bracket. So you call the up, so this, we released the spin, we released the, um, the quote unquote semaphore, but now we're waking up the, the next guy that's waiting on that semaphore. So we have to wake up the waiter for the semaphore. And then something happens where there's a print K lock, but then it goes and grabs that semaphore lock again, and now it locks deadlock. So you can actually deadlock within print K. Unfortunately, lock depth doesn't, we, we lock depth requires some validation, and it could kind of detect this. And I guess what happened was we kind of disabled lock depth validation within print K. We're just like, we understand there's a deadlock here, but you know, if you do this, every time you had a print K, lock depth would say, hey, you could have a possible deadlock, and it would just uh, stop, the, uh, you're done checking uh, lock depth. So the only way to get lock depth to work is to turn off print K, but then if it detected something, you'd never be able to know if it happened. Um, so that was a problem. So print K has three different locks. We have your log buff lock, console lock, and console owner lock. And I said, print K, if it causes a deadlock, it, so if print K causes a deadlock, because the console lock does something thing, lock depth also will print out a report, and it uses print K, which will itself, so lock depth itself can now cause a, uh, a, a deadlock itself, which really would suck. That um, your system would be running, it would just die, lock up, and you like you enable print K or lock depth to figure out why it locked up, and then print K itself caused the deadlock, and then lock depth try or no print you, the lock depth would tri figure out that ooh there's a deadlock here and it will print and then it would lock your system up without ever telling you what the problem was, because it deadlocked before it could get the data out. So in 4.11, uh, a new functionality came, which was called print K safe, which was similar to the NMI print K, and this required to manually mark areas in within the print K code that can possibly recurse on itself and deadlock. And it would use a counter to uh, determine like um, unsafe region, the, the it would increment before going into an unsafe region and decrement when it leaves the, the unsafe region. And if, if um, the value was greater than zero, it would use a separate buffer. It wouldn't, or it would do something different. It would not, do the normal print K, it would uh, not do the console lock because it says, hey, we're inside this, um, uh, what's it called? If we go within print K, we'd say, um, I'm trying to get my mind straight here. The avoid totally threw me off. Um, <laughs> so <coughs> it would it just actually work like NMI print K, okay, within inside the print K. Let's just leave it at that. You can figure it out. Um, <laughs> See, that would make my talk so much shorter. You just figure it out. Here's my slides. Goodbye. <laughs> so print K uh, was no longer a function pointer. Mario said it was a function pointer that switched back and forth, but it, it turned into a single function as a multiplexer. Uh, it uses a per CPU context for flags of a counter and what it de that's what's used to determine what function should be used. And we had to make sure to prevent this uh, log buff thing, so um, uh, I guess... Uh, um, I think it's done with the, whenever you had to grab this log bus spin lock because that could cause one of the deadlocks to increment you had to use the print case safe and then decrement it outside the print uh, log buff lock this way that's right because you need to do that for NMIs as well um, and now the NMI code we don't use the, NMI, the, the vprint NMI or the NMI print K anymore this thing actually handles everything else so inside when the NMI triggers uh, we look at this print K context that has that increment variable. And if um, we mask it against the, the counter, and if it's set, that means we're in a, um, a location where log buff can lock up. So we checked, is log buff locked? If it is, 
we're going to say, hey, let's go into this NMI context. Otherwise, if either any of those cases are coming in, we're going to into a NMI deferred context, which goes back to the kind of the original way. Um, and when we exit, we just clear out the flags. So now when we do, um, oh, this is, this is basically my English version of this, of this code. I forgot I did this. Um, so if print k safe is active, if console max mask is greater than zero, then we're, and log buff is locked, then we're going to call the vprintk nmi. Otherwise, we call uh, the vk print. Um, so the vprintk function now is this is what all printk calls. So it's not, I remember I said, when you call printk, printk now calls vprintk directly. It doesn't actually cause a function pointer, it calls this uh, multiplexer. Um, it checks the context and compares it to uh, the nmi mask. And if it's set, we're going to do the nmi. Otherwise, we, if, if that's not true, we check to see if the, um, we're in a nested, uh, nested area uh, position, so we'll do the print k safe. Otherwise, if we're in a deferred context, we're going to print k, uh, and, uh, print k deferred. Otherwise, print k default, which is what print k did basically all the way back to version 1.0. Well, in the meantime, like I said, um, Systemd likes to write to printk. This is kind of like all the issues that we have to deal with for printk, so I wanted to bring this up. So user space can write into that fixed size memory ring buffer. It uses the interface of proc k message. And unfortunately, what happens is you could have a case where you, uh, if user space goes crazy or if there's a bug, it just spits into the buffer and say if you, it had a bug because there was a kernel bug, uh, the kernel bug could have done something did a print k something or warn on, then systemd could say, oh, something's not right, and spin a bunch of debug in, in there, and you just lost the warn on. So this is one of the issues that we need to fix. One thing that uh, people love, a uh, few developers really, really love, is early print k. Now, one of the questions that is given on, I guess, the Linux Foundation uh, uh, teaching kernel development is like, when does print k not work? Well, it actually does work well, and that's at early boot up. Before the consoles are registered, before there's any console there, there's no print k. Uh, and if something dies during, before consoles are registered, you just see a black screen on your machine when you boot it up, where print k's are actually happening. So we created um, early print k, which actually writes to the log buffer or whatever, but actually what early print k does is not only does it write to the log buffer, it actually, when you call print k, it will write to wherever you said it's going to write to, whether it's a serial, VGA, or whatever. It will do the write at, su it doesn't care about the, the buffers. It will write to the log buffer, but it will also write straight to the console as well without grabbing locks. Early print case, basically a little version of, it's like a tight version that says just write to the console, and if we blow everything, if we, if we mess up the buffers within the console, whether it's a serial port or whatever, so bad, to be, uh, we don't care. We just want data going out when it happens. Force it, no locks. Uh, just write data out. Um, the serial port's rather easy to do because it's just a serial port, where VGA buffers could be kind of a more of a uh, more complex thing. But usually serial is the one that you do because of just the complexity of the output. Serial is really easy to write up, but it's very slow, which is a problem. If everything you print, your system stops until it prints out. Uh, if you want early print K to exist after registered of consoles, because when the when consoles are registered, early print K will remove itself out because usually it was written just to be able to see the data before print K consoles were there. That's why it writes straight out instead of going worrying about consoles. So if you want your early print K to still be there because print K is messing up for all these issues I've already talked about, you put comma keep behind in your kernel command line and it will stay there. Uh, right now, one of the code that's being worked on, I think we have patches, there's lots of patches out already, is force early print k to basically say, don't bother with print k at all, just call it early print k. And actually, it's one of those things, print k goes in, it says, just do that, which might be part of the multiplexer. Unfortunately, today is getting much, much more difficult to find a UART. Uh, everyone here has a laptop. Anyone in this room that has your laptop has a serial interface. Not a single hand. That's really sad. This doesn't either. It's really hard to debug your laptop if something crashes because, or you, this is where you do the camera, take a picture of the last crash, and you have to, okay, only see what you get, which is a problem. So we have to handle that. 
Other methods, we could do network console. There's a delay print K. That's been there forever, too, where it will actually, every print K will go out, will pause. And so if you don't mind waiting a long time for the system to boot up because it prints, it pauses a couple seconds for every print K that line that goes out. Count, count how many print K lines are in your um, uh, D message, and then add a second for each one or something like that. K exec gate up, I love it. I use that all the time. That's how I get a lot of my data. Like I said, it could read the, it, the crash utility could read the log buffers for print K. So summary, um, print K is a way to display information for you. Um, those kernel events of so everything else like that wants the kernel wants to talk to you about it. Print K must retain serial order. That's why log buff is a single buffer. We have we've talked about having multiple buffers and stuff like that, but people want the order of the actual when the print K happened. We want that in order with every all of the print Ks that happened out. And ideally, we want as much information possible before the machine dies. Other than that, I don't know if I have time or not. I don't. Too bad. Thank you. <laughs>